the past few weeks, we've been doing a series on listening to God. And the, the theme, of course, is that God speaks. And if God is speaking, we need to be able to hear him, as Jesus said, for him who has ears to hear, let him hear. The, uh, the first week we talked about how God speaks through the still, small voice. And we talked about how we can get rid of some of the distractions that we find in our lives that prevent us from hearing the voice of God. And then we heard how God speaks to sinners, and he has some very important things to say to us who are sinners. And that sermon is still out there. Uh, if you go on Facebook, uh, you can find all of the previous week's sermons uh, going back, really, it's for a couple of years if you really look for it. But that is a good one if you're looking for ways to overcome the, the bad habits that are in your life. It talks about the, the cycle of continuous improvement. And uh, last week, we talked about how God speaks to his children and how the expectation is not that we stay as spiritual babies, but that we grow up and become responsible adults uh, within the kingdom. Today I want to talk about what God says about himself. God speaks of his nature. And the word of God has a lot to say about who he is. And people have different ideas of what God is like. And I'm sure if I were to ask you, you could give me attributes of God. In fact, maybe I will. What are some attributes of God that you can think of? Loving. Loving, forgiving, forgiving just, just, kind, kind perfect, perfect protective. protective. Okay, all of those things are, uh, are ways that God describes himself. And in some might argue whether those are primary attributes or those are secondary attributes, but they are things that God tells us about himself. If we didn't have the word of God, we wouldn't know these things, would we? If we looked only at nature, we would find that God is a creative person, that he's a person of order and of detail, and that everything he does has a purpose in it. We could see those things, but in terms of how God is holy and how he uh, is directing us toward a redemptive work in this world that is going to culminate with a massive spiritual battle that's going to spill over into the material world so that this earth and this entire universe is going to be destroyed and then remade, you wouldn't see any of that because the way our nature works, we tend to think that what is always was. And what always was, always will be. And that's why we get ideas that this world and this universe must be billions of years old, because that's how long it would take for things to happen that we have a world like we have today. Of course, we now know that it would take more than billions of years. It would take quadrillions of years for that to happen, because the, the odds that all things would come together in the way that they are, are simply astronomical, impossible. It takes greater faith to believe in that than it does to believe in a God who lovingly and purposely created us. But even if you believe these things, people come up with their own ideas of God. I hear these things when I, as a chaplain, when I'm talking to them. And I have to keep my mouth shut sometimes because my role as a chaplain is not necessarily to evangelize unless they give me permission to do it. So this past week, somebody told me that she believes in God and she communes with him in nature and that she believes and even has memories of reincarnation. Okay, so I, I nod my head and say, well, that's very interesting. I've never met anybody who could remember a previous life. Tell me about it. So she tells me about it, but she doesn't have a whole lot of details. And, and I was so tempted to ask the question, you're wrong, you want to know? 
And I'm hopeful that I'll have an opportunity to do that. That I have to be careful not to overstep my bounds as a chaplain. But here, I don't have to worry about that. Here, I can present Jesus Christ as he reveals himself. And I can present God the Father as he reveals himself. And I can present the Holy Spirit as he reveals himself in Scripture. So the first scripture I want to look at is the one in Revelation, which we read earlier. And I believe the core attribute of God is that he is holy. Holy is a confusing word. Does anybody know what holy means? Without sin? Actually, holy means that he is set apart. He is transcendent. There is nothing or no one like him, and anything that exists is separated from him. He is beyond. He is holy. He is unique. And in that uniqueness, he is without sin. Because all that exists that is good is defined as good by his nature. And so whatever he is, is good. Does that make sense? He can't contradict himself. If you remember your geometry, A equals A and B equals B, whether it's a line or an angle or a triangle. Well, God equals God, and good equals good, and holy is holy. The passage that we read in Revelation was a vision that the Apostle John had when he was on the, Mount, uh, on the island of Patmos, and he was brought into God's very presence, and he saw the throne of God. He saw 24 elders that were before him, and they were, and the uh, seraphim, four seraphim, were all around the, tent, the, uh, the throne, and they were singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Now, the elders, they responded in verse 11 by saying, You are worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So this is a an artist's rendition of this whole passage and what the, what was described here. And you can see the elders bowing down before the throne. And you can see the seraphims flying over top of the throne, crying out. When there is no sin in the picture, the response is to worship God without any kind of fear. I'd like to share with you a similar passage in the Bible. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet saw the throne of God. He saw the same things. He saw the seraphim. He saw all the things going on. And he even heard the same song, but a different verse. And I can imagine these seraphim are just constantly singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, and it could be the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Redeemer, whatever it is. And then having a phrase that describes it, and it's just going on forever and ever and ever. And in this particular case, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And how did, he, how did Isaiah respond? Well, it was not by bowing down in, in heartfelt worship. He said, whoa. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, when God is holy, and he is, and we are sinners, and we are, the two cannot exist in the same place. The one reveals the other and consumes it. And that's why we need a Savior. If we are brought into the presence of God, as without a Redeemer, we're in trouble. It would be, I'm trying to think of an analogy, it would be like trying to grab a hold of, of a high, hot, a hot of wire without any kind of insulation. It would fry us. That's kind of what would happen. And so Isaiah is in the process of being fried. <laughs> Later on in that passage, one of the seraphim came down and touched his lips and purified him so that he was, in fact, to be in the presence of God. 
So if you feel that you're a sinner and you can, you can sense that, that's good. That's evidence that you have been exposed to the Holy Spirit. Those people who do not recognize their sin and are just living in it, like fish in water, they're the ones that really ought, should be worried. And of course they're not. They're the ones that are just going through life. The opposite of holiness is profanity. And we do profane God in our lives sometimes. I've been reading through or listening to the scriptures, and this week I was in Ezekiel. And at the end of the book of Ezekiel, God talks about why he is so angry with the Jewish people. And the answer was that they had profaned his name. God was a holy God, and he was living within their presence. Out of all the nations of the world, he selected them to be his ambassadors to the world. He selected their city to be where he would dwell. He selected his, a building to be his temple where his glory was going to reside. But what did they do? Well, they broke his laws. They started doing commerce on Saturdays instead of keeping the Sabbath holy. Instead of reserving that temple for the Lord only, they began to let other things litter the temple and fill the space. Sometimes it was even idols. Other times it was just mundane things. People putting their grain there, turning turning the temple into a garage or or a, or a silo, and then later on, people started to even build their buildings right up next to the temple. All of these things made God really living because He is holy, and He wants to be treated as holy. He wants to be respected. So, how do we profane our Lord? Well, you know we are. In fact, the temple of the Lord. So we'll talk about how we can become holy because we don't want to be profaning God. We want to be exalting him. The next passage I want us to look at talks of justice. And it's in Exodus 34. The passage that was read this morning talks about the time when the, the tablets of stone were given to Moses by God. And so... This demonstrates that God is a God of justice. And God describes himself in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. He says, the Lord, the Lord God. Now I'm going to stop right there. That is the name that God revealed to himself, uh, of himself in Exodus 3. Yahweh. Jehovah. The one who is. The only one who is. When the Jewish people used to write this, the scribes, every time they came across the name Yahweh, they would throw their pen away because it had now been exposed to the name of the Lord. They would never use the name Yahweh in their speaking. They changed it. And use the word Adonai. Because Yahweh is too holy to be spoken. And we have come to a place in our lives that we've forgotten just how holy God is. And there's reasons for that. I think that people took it too far at one point, And then they didn't take it far enough at another point. But there's a place where we need to recognize that God is awe-inspiring. And we want to have awe of him. But here's what God says. He says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Boy, does that sound like justice? And yet it is. Because God is not after crushing people. He is after saving people. That has always been his agenda. He has always wanted people to come to repentance. He does not take delight in destroying people. However, sometimes people simply harden their hearts toward him, and they give him the fist, or worse, the finger, 
and they say, I'm going to do it my way. 